Good morning, folks. Check out this plasma filament simply refusing to leave the corona. It was a gorgeous display to kick off today's show, and we're going to start with our star, as always, over at spaceweathernews.com and find that the last 24 hours on the sun led the southern coronal hole extension through the Earth-facing heliographic longitudes. That southern incoming plasma filament was not the only activity around the limb. There were considerable plasma motions emanating from just behind our visible range there on the north. Solar wind here, and we find that the plasma stream has not only remained relatively stable, but has done so within ambient calm, quiet range. The quiet solar wind has geomagnetic conditions continuing their low marks, quiet few days in the field here. Quick look at Indonesia. Flooding in the West Java region here, and when it comes in, it settles and takes quite a while to disappear. We're going out to Mars next. A fun revision of the magnetic field age on the red planet leaves the question a bit open-ended. After scientists had believed the field must have collapsed more than 3.9 billion years ago, they have found a region still resonant with magnetism that was no later than 3.7 billion years ago, indicating that the field was still around at the time of its formation, and it's back to the search for a real end date. Interesting release here from the ESA on abnormal methane. Some make sense in industrial areas or near the polar region where thinning permafrost can be blamed, but what about the other areas without as much industry and nowhere near the polar regions? This is not exactly what one might expect from such a distribution map. Speaking of the polar regions, they've got Greenland and Antarctica here showing the ice change on the land. Interestingly, they show Greenland is losing ice around the entire periphery, but gaining considerable ice within the landmass and growing ever taller. In Antarctica, it was a much more even distribution, numerous areas melting, numerous areas gaining ice at a considerable clip. Note how the strongest melts are where those undersea volcanoes were shown to be erupting. Quick point of interest from SLAC here. On the left, we see 1,3-cyclohexadine, a ring molecule, and on the right, we find what it looks like after getting blasted by light, leaving a two-lobed leviathan particle with excited electron states around the outside. And they think this can help elucidate light-driven rapid reactions inside our bodies, just like the production of vitamin D from sunlight. Up next, the ubiquitous space science concept that dust grains in space are covered with thick, multi-layer substrate, water, and other specks of material, just like a snowball you make is rarely 100% pristine frozen water. Now, experimental evidence is showing thin, mono layers of pure ice are indeed able to coat the dust, and that is preferred, almost like a polarized molecule preference, if you will. And they say that the way we look at dust around the cosmos is going to have to be completely reimagined. Let's move on to disks around celestial spheres. This is one area where astronomers are regularly baffled by finding things they didn't see before. And in this case, it's a well-studied star that was recently studied again, and they realized, oh wait, there's actually a giant disk around this star. Having to rethink dust, finding things hiding in plain sight. If you're thinking, hey, you were just talking about that last night. Yes, yes I was. Thanks for noticing. Moving on to the darkest and often hardest to see of the physical matter of the universe, the carbon black materials. Interestingly, they not only raise the brow at the amount of coal and petroleum and similar substances in space, but they say they are produced by shock waves and radiation heating. What, like a super flare CME or a micronova shell release? Anyway, salmon jump up on the list of magnetic animals. Once again, here it is a navigational influence, which of course plays into reproduction, the long salmon river journey, finding food, etc. And last but not least, for the second time in a year, we've got a super lightning event. This one was in Deerfield, Massachusetts, and the lightning bolt blasted rock and dirt away from the strike point. Many of the rocks came like debris from a dynamite explosion and tore right through the house, luckily missing everyone. Folks, if they are right about magnetar discharges in the lowest level L-shell magnetic fields of Earth, then it is utterly possible that a major solar wind impact juices up enough the lower level shells while they are being compressed, and they are going to arc down. If a lightning bolt can make trees explode and send rock and dirt blasting through the air, exactly what do you think is going to happen if we truly get a planetary scale bolt? Global EMP for sure, and likely some geologic electro-terraforming. 
We greatly appreciate your support. Last week here to pre-order our third edition of Weatherman's Guide to the Sun, a reminder that the new chapter, Chapter 8, is all about those most major solar events. We've got your wind map forecasts and shots of our star to close, and of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow. Right here, but right now, it's 5 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.